we move on with uh, Dr. Drozdowski and we are going to uh, add a little bit yttrium to our LUAC and talk about prosodymium, I presume. Okay, hope it's fine. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I will talk about the mixed crystals of uh, oxide garnet activated with prosodymium, lutetium and yttrium aluminum garnets. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me. This presentation is just the final step uh, in the project which we had uh, in the last three years. So uh, I will focus on two aspects. Uh, in the first part of the presentation, I will show some studies of the internal structure of these crystals. So I will focus on XPS, XRD, magnetic susceptibility, <laughs> and T-of-SIMS uh, experiments. And in the second part, I will tell a few words about double beam studies on these crystals. I think I don't need to introduce this material because it's very well known. Uh, it was uh, it, it had its debut in 2005. Here, these are the most important parameters related to these crystals. And uh, in our project, we wanted to do something with this value of scintillation yield, which is not so low, but also not so high. High, and uh, there is some room for improvement. So we looked closely at this curve, which shows the dependence of the scintillation yield as a function of temperature. And what we can notice, that the maximum yield for LUAC with praseodymium is achieved at about 450 kelvins. And uh, we know that this curve is closely related to the existence of uh, electron traps in this material. So the idea was just to shift this curve to lower temperatures in order to achieve the maximum light yield already at room temperature. And in frames of the project, we wanted to do this. In frames of so-called band gap engineering, I think it's the name which was introduced for the first by the group of uh, Professor Nickel, and the first paper was by uh, Moretti, I think. And the second way was just to add some molybdenum to the uh, LUAC crystals with prosodymium. So uh, today I will focus on the first group of the crystals. And uh, this is just a reminder that, uh, because it was showed before, uh, we succeeded. Uh, and in case of the crystal in which one fourth of uh, lutetium is re replaced by yttrium, we really observe a large increase of scintillation yield. This is a picture for thin plate crystals, and we see that uh, the increase of yield is more than 50%. So it went well, and now let's take a look what's inside in the crystals. Uh, now here I show some representative spectra of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. What do we see here? Uh, we have very clear, nice, nicely resolved lines which can be attributed only to the constituents of the crystals. There is only one line that doesn't depend to any of the crystal components, but this is the well-known carbon line, which enables to calibrate the spectra. So based on the XPS studies, we can conclude that the crystals have very nice structure, they are very clear, and everything works well in our series of uh, the growth of the mixed crystals, by the Krauski method. Uh, here, uh, these are the lattice parameter values that are derived from XRD studies, X-ray uh, diffraction studies. And also, we can see that uh, if we denote the lutetium to yttrium ratio as X, then when we increase the amount of lutetium and decrease the amount of yttrium, then the lattice parameters goes down. And this is uh, closely related with the fact that the ionic radius of lutetium 3+, is lower than uh, that of yttrium 3+. 
So we have here a nice linear re relation which satisfies the Weger's law. So this is another uh, site that shows that everything is all right with these crystals. And uh, here these are uh, the values of magnetic susceptibility studied as a function of temperature. And what we can do with these results, we can uh, fit the Curie-Weiss Curie law in order to determine the concentration which, of praseodymium in the crystal. And there is a surprise, because here, if we look at the values, uh, the values derived from the magnetic measurements are higher than the values uh, which were derived before from ICP OS uh, methods. And this is strange. We don't know how to explain it, so this deserves further investigation. Uh, the worst thing about it is that there is no correlation, because uh, with ICP methods we get the highest presodymium concentration in this crystal and with magnetic susceptibility here for this crystal. So this is a surprise, this is still a mystery and we are thinking about it, how to solve it. Okay, and now some tough sims uh, uh, plots. So here we see the structure of uh, selected layers and uh, the uh, spatial distribution of elements. First for the crystal constituents, so everything looks fine here and then for some contaminations inside the crystals. And we see that, that there are some elements that contaminate these crystals, but their level is very low. So we can say it's just on the standard low level. And we see that, that these contaminations, uh, the amount of these contaminations strongly decreases with the crystal depth. And here we have uh, depth profiles from the Tofsim's method. And we see that in case of uh, the crystal constituents, there are almost uh, vertical lines, it's okay. And with an exemplary contamination, we see it goes down with depth. So the good quality of the crystals is confirmed again. And now let's go to the second part. Uh, we have constructed uh, a setup that enables us to study the crystals at a double beam excitation. So the sample is kept in a cross jet. Uh, it can be cooled down to 10 kelvins. And we are capable of irradiating the samples simultaneously uh, with X-rays coming from an inner system and with infrared radiation which is provided by a laser diode. There is also a monochromator in this system because we can measure spectra. However, in the experiments, the results of which I will show you in a while, the monochromator is just set to zeroth order. So we looked at the total emission, which is not wavelength resolved. And uh, first, uh, we can see some uh, freeze frames because we just study it uh, in an automated uh, sequence. Uh, what we see here, when we irradiate the sample only with X-rays, this is this part, and here this part, and this one, and here this large part, then we see a level of uh, the sample radioluminescence. If we impose uh, infrared on the extra irradiation, the signal goes up. So it's increased. We see it here, also here, and in this part. Moreover, if the X-rays are on and we start infrared irradiation, so we just switch on the laser, we see a kind of a decay. It's here and also here. And in this part, the X-rays are off, but we switch on the laser and also see this is optically stimulated decay here. And now I will show it as an animation, because we measure it in an automated sequ sequence. So we can just take a look. What we change here is the moment we switch on the laser, switch off the laser. So this moving part is a part during which the laser is on. Okay, and now it's the end of this animation. I think I can just stop it.
in a representative slide, okay, like this. Oh, I know, <laughs> I don't know why it disappears, I'm sorry for that. Okay, however, what we observe, if there is no infrared radiation and we switch off the X-rays, then we see a complicated decay. Oh, that's a pity, we do not see it here, maybe here on this freeze frame we will be able to see it. Now I mean this part here, there is no laser, we have only X-rays and we switch the X-rays off. And we see this is, there is a complicated multi-component decay. So we suspect that there is some direct component here and here this is just afterglow. However, when uh, we stimulate the crystal with infrared light, then it doesn't matter if the X-rays are on or off. We observe this kind of decay. What we can add to this experiment, we can just try to measure thermoluminescence. And this is a standard glow curve of Lua with praseodymium, irradiated at 10 kelvins. And this second curve is the same measurement with only a very short shot of laser light, one second. So we irradiate the crystals by 10 minutes, like here. And then, before hitting the crystal, we just switch on the laser for one second and we see that the whole TL is bleached. So, this focuses our attention on shallow traps that are in the crystals, but can be completely emptied by laser radiation. And here, in this figure, there is one of the profiles showed before, but plotted on a different scale. Here, instead of intensity, we have inverse square root of intensity. And what we do, this is this part, well, because this is the afterglow, and here this is the single laser shot, which produces optically stimulated decay. And if we see at these points, we can fit a straight line, which focuses our attention on bimolecular kinetics, because this is the inverse of the square root. So, if we fit such a curve, that means that we, here, we deal here with uh, biomolecular kinetics. So there must be two recombining species. And we suspect that one of these species are just conduction band electrons, which are freed from traps. Um, uh, the traps are just emptied by the laser radiation. And the second species are frazolidemium 4 plus ions. Why 4 plus? Because, of course, in the crystal there are Prasodymium 3 plus ions, but they can easily capture holes during the X ray radiation. So they change their charge state to 4 plus and just wait for electrons. And when we switch on the laser, we free these electrons from traps and then we observe a bimolecular decay law. This is here. Uh, this is much more complicated in the two other parts. Here, this is the part in which the X-rays are on and then they are switched off. So if we shift these curves, just mechanically we shift it to fit these points, we do not fit here. So this is a proof that this kin kinetics here is much more complicated. There are more components. Uh, here in this part, when the X-rays are on and then we switch the laser on, there is probably some contribution from bimolecular kinetics. Okay, so let's conclude. From the first part, uh, I wanted to, in the first part, I wanted just to show you that we studied the interior of these crystals, and we claim that these crystals have very good uh, quality. The only problem is this with the real praseodymium concentration. So we will be investigating it in the future. And in the second part, uh, I showed you that we observe bimolecular decay. Uh, of uh, the crystals uh, in case we just uh, empty the traps with uh, laser radiation. And uh, the most important conclusion coming from it is that the main scintillation mechanism in LUAC and LUAC and YAC crystals activated with praseodymium must be just a consecutive capture of charge carriers, probably first holes and then electrons at presodymium sites, which agrees with our previous expectations. Thank you for attention.
Thank you for showing that the combination of X-rays and optical spectroscopy can be very, uh, or optical stimulation can be very informative. You have time for one question. You don't try any synchronization between your X-ray excitation and uh, infrared laser. You just turn on and turn off, but you don't have really pulsed X-ray and synchronize it with the infrared, right? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I uh, understand it properly. You don't have you don't synchronize the X-ray excitation with the infrared laser, uh, right? We can do whatever we want. We are just thinking how to make the, the, the best uh, possible experiments. We can uh, operate both uh, sources independently. Yeah, but you have a bolted X-ray that you can synchronize it with the laser. No, no, the X-ray is still like it's a constant irradiation. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not, not pulsed. Yeah, so no, it's no, not no, no, no. To it's not pulsed. I'm sorry, I've got just a curiosity. Uh, I didn't get what wavelength you're using for your laser, nor the power. A eight hundred thirty. So could you have some heating up of your sample? Uh, no, we don't think so, because all these uh, frame, freeze frames, it was 10 kelvins in the cryostat. And just last one, have you noticed any change in the uh, luminescence decay by changing the laser power? Uh, we have performed such studies. I'm sorry, I have no pictures here. There are some uh, variations which also are in agreement with this biomolecular mechanism. Because we, we tried to change the current of the laser and then we observe. I think uh, there is uh, some time during uh, coffee break or so I can show you because I have on my computer if you're interested. Okay, we have to conclude here. Thank you uh, once again.